Um, it says, why did Paul willingly take the position of slave of Jesus Christ? Okay? Because Paul was filled with love and gratitude to the Lord for deliverance from sin, Satan, and everlasting judgment. You hear that? Why did Paul willingly take the position of a slave of Jesus Christ? Because, oh yeah, think about it. Where did Paul meet Christ? The road to Damascus. Right? What was Paul involved in doing at, the, at that point in time? Right. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest, kill, or do whatever needed to be done. And, you know, he thought he was doing everything right. He thought he was obeying God, so to speak. He, he is, was right out of religion, to be honest with you. Right out of religion by following all the rules according to the rule book, okay? But he did not have a love relationship with the Lord. He didn't really know the Lord. He knew about him. He knew he knew intellect of Bible doctrine, but he didn't really know the Lord personally. Why also? Because before he was saved, he didn't have the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So he could not know the truth, would not know the truth, because the Holy Spirit did not dwell within him. So he was following the rule book, so to speak. He was following the scrolls as this is what we're doing. As a matter of fact, as we know, he thought that Jesus was what? A Satanist. You know, himself, he thought Jesus was, was working for the devil here. But again, so he became a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means sold out, you know, as an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I think he knew about Jesus a lot. Not, to, I mean, a lot about him and right. what he was doing. Because that's what Jesus said. It's me, Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Why, why are you, right, exactly. So, he knew, right, he knew about him. That's a good statement you're making. Because, you know, you can tie that right into your salvation. You can know a lot about someone. I, you know, we give an example I know a lot about Abraham Lincoln and his background and everything that he did and so forth. But I never met Abraham Lincoln personally. I never had a personal relationship with Abe Lincoln. It would have been nice to have one, but I never did. So the same thing with the Lord the same. He knew a lot about Jesus, but he didn't know him as Messiah, as the Lord. He didn't know him personally, intimately, because if he did, he would have you know, knew him as Lord and Savior. But eventually, as we understand, uh, Jesus, the resurrected Christ, uh, appears to him through this bright light, which therefore blinded uh, Paul. You know, it's such a dramatic story there in the book of Acts. You know, you can just imagine that. Uh, you can just see Paul riding on his horse there, going into Damascus, and all of a sudden, the, the Christ, Christ comes in his this brilliancy of light, you know, and I can just imagine you put yourself there, and uh, you know, seeing Paul thrown off the horse, laying on the ground and blind, and what's going on, and then here's the voice of Christ. Could you imagine? I mean, that, that's like you know, phenomenal to, to even just put yourself out there. But anyway, that's then he, of course, got converted through through that situation here. Okay, it says. What did Paul mean when he called himself an apostle? We talked about that all the time. He meant that he was chosen by the Lord Jesus and sent out to represent him. And he was personally uh, discipled at this point in time by Christ himself there. Okay, that's what apostles are. We talked about that many times there. <clears throat> okay, what does it mean when God says that believers are called saints? Okay. It means that from the time we heard and believed God, we were what? Sainthood, again, is like sanctification, means set apart. Set apart. Okay? That's why we are called saints. Scripture throughout the Testament, the Gospels, or even the Epistles, uh, you know, refers to Christians as the saints. Okay? They're the called out ones. God has set us apart from unbelieving world to be used only by him to do his will. Okay? 
Why did Paul consider himself to be in debt to all people? Okay? Because the gospel which God intended for all people had been entrusted to him. So he felt indebted to them that God had entrusted him with the gospel to go out and give out the truth there. Okay? And that's, again, reading in, uh, in our Bibles just for a moment here. Uh, let's go to Romans 1. And read 14 and 15. Romans chapter 1. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in, is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Right, very good. See, so it says he's adapted to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Okay. Because God has called him to do this. Okay, it says, To whom has the Lord now entrusted the gospel? Okay, to whom now has the Lord entrusted the gospel to? Basic question. Right. He entrusted to Paul, didn't he? Right, right, but now... In our in our world, who's it entrusted to? Yeah. Us, us. Oh, okay. You mean us. now? Okay. Yes, us as the believers. In other words, now the ball's been handed down to us, been passed over to us. We are to take the ball and go with it, which means now we're entrusted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, because there's no more apostles. The Bible's complete from Genesis to Revelations. Now we are to take it. And share it. Okay. We are responsible to take good news to people everywhere who have never heard it. Why hasn't Paul, what, I'm sorry, why wasn't Paul ashamed to preach the gospel even in Rome, which was the city where the emperor lived? It says, because the news that Jesus died for sinners was buried and rose again on the third day is a powerful message which God used to deliver all believers from sin, Satan, and everlasting death. Okay, then it has here, let's read 116, which says right here in our Bible, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power to salvation for everyone who believes. It is the power that for everyone who believes. Okay, and that power comes from God, which is in us, which is the Holy Spirit, which is Christ living on the inside of us. What did Paul mean when he said in verse 17, that in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. Okay, this means through the gospel, God shows how he can remain perfectly righteous at the same time forgive all sins of those who trust only in him. He accepts believers as perfectly righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he is the only one that can forgive sins because he is the only one that was righteous and he went to the cross on our behalf. So remember, it's not about it's not about what we can do. It's about what he did for us. Okay. And then we have what we all love. <laughs> our memory verse. Memory verse is Romans 16 and 17. If you get an opportunity, try to take this into your heart and memorize it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, and right there, that's, that's right there, a really understanding of the book of Romans right there. Okay, now we're going to move on a little bit. It says... When God created everything, sin did not exist in the beginning. For, for a time, Adam and Eve walked in close fellowship with their creator, God. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God. Along with them, all mankind was plunged into sin and separation from God. The penalty for sin is death. Okay, so when they sinned, they were separated from God because of their what they did wrong. They sinned. Okay, let's read. Somebody read verse 118 in Romans. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of unrighteousness. Huh. Okay. All right. And who knows Romans 6.23? Right. The wages of sin is death. Okay? See? And this is what happened with Adam and Eve. Okay? They didn't, uh, well, they didn't die physically, but eventually they would. You know, uh, man was is an eternal being. Okay? He lived for eternity. But they died spiritually. Just like she just, Parker just said, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody read Romans 5.12. These are just cross references so we can go on. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as though one man has sinned, entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. Right. See, all sin, because basically we inherited sin from Adam and Eve. We inherited the sin nature. Yeah. Okay. Says one man. Pardon me? <laughs> Mine says one man. Yeah. Not Adam and Eve. No, yeah. Well, yeah, basically Adam. Uh, all are sinners because of the sin. Okay. At various times in history of the world, God has revealed his wrath against man's sin and hatred of God. The majority of the world refuses to take notice of God's warnings. Therefore, God demonstrates his wrath by punishing people for their sins. For their sins. He first revealed his wrath in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned by what? Rebelling God. And remember that? And what did that? Uh, what did Adam do? Remember, he what? He blamed Eve. He said, it's the... She told yeah, the woman you gave. <laughs> so right there, that started the blame game. <laughs> Push it on right back, and Adam and Eve were like... And basically, that's something with Adam. Adam's actually going to God. <laughs> telling God, listen, like God, you... Gave her to me, and she's. I did it because of her. If you didn't give her to me, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> so instead of taking the rap for himself, that's what he said there. Okay, so it started back thousands of years ago with Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, therefore God demonstrates his wrath by punishing people for sins. He first revealed his wrath in the garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned by rebelling. Rebelling God. Therefore, God cursed the earth and put Adam and Eve out of the garden which he had planted for them. Since that time, there has been sickness, sorrow, death throughout the whole world. Okay. Um, somebody just read, this is just a couple of verses. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. Just back in the beginning of the Bible. Just, just a cross reference here. Talking about Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, what? Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. So the Lord God, God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he said, Adam, how to cultivate the ground from which he had been which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden. And he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. Yeah, see, um, there's another story here. I don't want to go to a lot, but in that essence, God's showing them grace. You would say, what are you talking about? He didn't want them getting back in there, you see, and going back to that tree. So he wanted to keep them out of there, okay? Because, see, you have to understand, God had a plan. He's saying he didn't want them to have to live in that sin nature for all eternity. So that's why he kept them out with the angels there and with the arrows. He didn't want to bring them back 
We didn't, we didn't want them to be, to be able to get back in there. Okay. Well, no one got back in, did they? No. 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 Okay. Every grave should be a reminder and warning that God hates and punishes sin. Okay. God's wrath against man's rebellion was, again, clearly displayed in the time of Noah. Okay. Somebody read Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. It's just one verse. Genesis 6, verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, that's it right there. Okay. So in other words, most of the people were wicked at that time, but again, Noah found favor. The Old Testament records many other times when God displayed his wrath against sin. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, that was another one. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Wasn't it Abraham that came to um, God and said, if, if there's 50 righteous people, will you not destroy this? And God said, yeah. And I believe we got it down to about 10 or so. And, you know, again, you know, it's interesting because I've talked with people through the past with Scripture, especially the Old Testament, and many times people look at God as he was really rough and, and you know what I mean? And just almost like evil or what have you. But he wasn't. There's a lot in there where you see the grace of God. So you see, and we want to understand that, that even though Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, God was sympathizing with Abraham and taking it down and down and down and down. Remember, a lot, a lot of them got out of there. But what about what happened to his wife? She turned to salt, right? Because what'd she do? She looked back at Egypt there, so to speak, Sodom. You know, and that's, there's a, a lesson right there. Don't look back at the world and think you're missing something. You know, because you're not. You know, actually not. want to see what's coming. <laughs> Pardon me? He said, you'd be afraid of what's coming. Yeah. It's more of a racket back Yeah, there. you know. I but look over my shoulder. That's it. You got to watch. And, and here his wife, she had to take that look back one more time. Right? I'm missing something. Okay? <laughs> God punished the Egyptians for refusing to obey his command to release his people, the Israelites. Remember that? Remember that? With Moses. God displayed his wrath against sin at the time when he gave his law to Israel at Mount Sinai. Okay? The whole mountain was ablaze with fire and covered with thick smoke and dark and it shook violently. God did all this to demonstrate to the Israelites his wrath against sin. But the New Testament records the greatest demonstration God has ever given us for hatred of sin. God punished his own son on the cross. What's Romans 5 8? God's shall confess his own mouth. No, no. But God. Mouth, uh, God demonstrated. Confess the Lord with your heart. No, that's Romans 10 9. Romans 5 8. But God. Commended his love for us, and that while we were in sin, Christ Hear that? But God commended or demonstrated his love for us. The greatest thing of love that can ever be was what God did on that cross. Demonstrated his love for us, in that while you and I were sinners, Christ died for us. He paid that ultimate price there. Okay? God punished his own son on the cross for our sins. When Jesus hung on the cross, darkness came over the whole land for three hours. Okay? Uh, let's look this. Somebody turn in the book of Luke 23 and read 44 to 45. Luke chapter 23 43 to 40 44 to 45 When it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness 
over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Right. Very good. See, the, the, the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple <coughs> was ripped, torn in two. Okay. Now that represents no more just the priests going to God. The Bible tells us we're not going to turn there, but as you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us in Peter that we are royal priests because we're the saints. You see, and when that says the veil was torn down from the top to the bottom, that revealed the fact that now we have access to God through Jesus Christ. And no longer did it have to go through uh, priests. Okay? No longer. That's, this is why uh, when we pray, what, when we always pray, we pray, what do we say? In Jesus' name. In Christ's name. We never just pray, dear Lord, we thank you in, in, in God's name or whatever. We pray in the name of Jesus. We always, because it's through Jesus Christ that God's hearing our prayer. And now through this, what happened through him going to the cross, the veil got torn and through, and no longer did they need priests to have just the access to God. Well, the door was open constantly to God. The priests themselves were not allowed to go in there no. just any time. No, so they had, were anointed. It's... Right, they were anointed at certain times to go in there. And once a year, the people would go in there, and they would do the blood animal sacrifices, and every year they would have to do this with the animals. And now with Jesus himself coming, that no longer had to be done. Again, think about it. That became a what? A religious ritual. You see? That's what we, this is what we have to do. We have to go through this. That's religion. You see? Here we constantly talk about religion and a relationship because we're not religious people. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. We do what we do because of our love in our relationship with Christ. We don't do it out of, uh, an, um, uh, just because I have to do this. It's, it's part of uh, uh, what we do, you know, to be accepted. No, no, we do what we do because we love the Lord and he died for you personally. Jesus Christ went to the cross for you personally. He didn't come for us as a group. We worship as a group, but he didn't come for all the people as one group one big family, he came for each individual. Like I would share, if you were the, uh, if Sis was the only person on this planet, Christ came for Sis himself, for her. Personally died for her. You see? And that's why it's called personal Savior. You see? And so, uh, again, uh, a lot of things point towards religion and we see that and we're, we're getting free from religion and opening up for a relationship with the Lord there. Just like, you know, I have to share, I thought, you know, after that, uh, I just thought this was so awesome because this is the way it should be. That, like the community picnic that was there on Sunday and, and uh, the different people from the different churches and all. Think about this. That is so awesome, everyone, because it's like this. It doesn't matter what building someone goes in on a Sunday morning and sits and worships God. You follow what I'm saying? It, do, it doesn't matter what building they're going to go sit in. In other words, at that outing there, you know, it was, I saw people from various churches that were there. And the point is that that's so awesome because that's what it's all about. It doesn't matter, like I just pointed out, where you go on a Sunday morning, what what building you go and sit in. You see what I mean? And that's what need that's that's what needs to be done, said, you know? Uh, we all go to different places and all, but we're we all have a love relationship with Christ. If we're saved, we're worshiping God together as the family of God. But I just thought that was so awesome because that kind of reminded me of the book of Acts, what we studied. How they all just were in one unity there. And again, uh, like this one was from Robertsdale, and that one was just, but, you know, the building's irrelevant where they go to. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping God together. That's what counts. That's, you know, we're all going to be 
in heaven together as a family one day. It's not going to be uh, uh, Broad Top City Church of God's over here, uh, Robert Stale's, uh, uh, oh, they're down here over there. You know, it's, that's not what it's going to be. We're all going to be together as the family of God. That's why I think that kind of stuff, it's just like the revivals that have been taking place and so forth, where the people coming together and, you know, Lord willing, we have another one here, we'll have another one here if, if, if need be. But the fact is, it doesn't matter, but it's the body of Christ getting together as a whole. See, and I'm taking it back to our Bible study, that can take place because the veil has been torn down. The veil has been torn down, so we're all to worship together, one big family in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So awesome when you think about it. See, and you know, it breaks away from the religious aspect of everything, and you see it in the light that it really is. Okay, let me move on here. And we read that part of the scripture there. We read 20 through 44 and 45 there. Okay. <clears throat> it says, but the New Testament records the greatest de demonstration of God has ever given us of his hatred of sin. He punished his son on the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, darkness came over the whole earth for three hours. The Lord Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These things recorded in the Bible reveal the whole world that God hates sin and will not allow it to go unpunished. God's anger against sin was poured out on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody read, uh, we've got a couple of verses here, uh, Matthew 27, 45 and 46. Matthew 27, 45 and 46. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled against him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the tenth, ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Amen. Okay, and now 2 Corinthians 5.21. Go to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians. made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, that's a powerful scripture here. You know? God made him to be sin that had no sin. You know? He took our place. We deserve to be nailed on that cross. Okay, it says, anyone who is not physically descended of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a Gentile. The Gentiles deliberately reject God and the truth. Who were the Gentiles? As I just pointed out, anyone who's not physically a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob is a Gentile. Okay? Beginning in Romans 1.18, Paul clearly shows that Gentiles deliberately turned their backs on the knowledge of God. Okay, let's read Romans. We're in the book of Romans here. Chapter 1. Let's read 18 to 20. Chapter 1. Somebody can read that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, and suppress the truth in righteousness, because that what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wow. Hear that one? Verse 20 tells everything. Verse 20 tells you atheism is nothing but a rebellion against God. There is no such thing as atheism. What is that atheism? They say what? There is no God. Now, if that's true, then you got to get rid of verse 20. 
See? Because verse 20 says, which you just read, for since creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made even by his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, all you have to do is just look at creation and in your heart you know you were born with it, you know that God exists. It's just that the sin nature has defiled that and rebellion is taking place and because of rebellion, the person who wants to love his sin and continue on his sin just has to say, I do not believe that God exists. I am an atheist. He does not exist, which is he's lying and that can't be true because Scripture tells us and God's word is truth. And if God's word is truth, verse 20 tells us that man is without excuse because his invisible attributes are clearly seen. In other words, you can clearly see that God, his attributes are clearly seen. By what? The creation of the world. All you have to do, think about it. You know, uh, I know, uh, a couple months back, I was outside in my yard and my dogs out. The stars were like, dropped so low. It was just so beautiful in there. And um, yeah, yeah, it was when uh, my daughter Angela Faith was here for a couple days here, she was here. Wow, Dad, look at them stars, they're beautiful. I said, see that, it was real. I said, that's how you know God exists. You see, you know God exists, you just see it. You know, to deny it is just rebellion. You know, how could you look at the stars, look at the moon, look at the balance of how everything is so perfectly balanced. That think about it, if the, if the sun would come a speck closer, we, we burn up. If it would go a little bit further out, we freeze to death. It's perfectly imbalanced, you see? And man knows this. He's just in his sin, you know, and uh, it's funny because he knows that God exists, you know, look, we have night, we have day, just like, you know, it's ironic how balanced we really are. Years ago, I had a job where I used to work the night shift, the graveyard shift, 12 to 8 for about a year. Boy, I could not sleep during the day. <laughs> Anybody ever work the night shift? <coughs> yeah, that's tough. And I tried everything because it wasn't natural to really sit. And I talked to people and it's, they would say, you know, you never, you just tolerate it. You never get used to it because it's out of balance. It's not natural. We're not really made to be up all night long and then sleep all day during the day. And of course, if we're sick and we're ill, it's different. But normally we're not made that way. But you know, you have jobs and different things in life you have to do, so, you know, um, uh, you have to try to balance it, but it, I was out of balance, because it was not natural to be able to, to sleep during the day. But, you know, verse 20 really speaks out loud, so when you hear people say they're atheists, there really no such thing as that. <clears throat> okay, they're just lying about their own rebellion there. Okay, and it says, the majority of the world refuses to take notice of God's warnings. Therefore, God demonstrates his wrath by punishing people for their sins. He first revealed his wrath in the Garden of Eden. You know, and then you think about this too. You know, everything in balance. You know, this is how silly it is when you think about this. If there's no God, why do we have laws? Why do we have rules? Why do we have regulations? Think about that. You wouldn't need nothing. You're not accountable to nothing. As long as you got in the way with it, you know, that's all that counts. There's no accountability. You see what I mean? So, of course, that's silliness. You see what I mean? But it just shows you how silly that is to, to not believe that he really does exist. It says, <clears throat> He first revealed his wrath in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned by rebelling God. Therefore God cursed the earth and put Adam and Eve out of the garden which he had planned for them. Okay. What's I read there? 
Okay, this is why we have sickness, sorrow, and death there. Okay. He clearly shows then the things he created that he exists and that he is all, the almighty God. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and all things on the earth are clear evidence to all people that he is almighty creator. Therefore, he should be worshipped as sovereign God, as sovereign God. Somebody read Psalm 19, 1 through 6. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. Proclaim the glory of God. The skies. What you said. Okay. Uh, the skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make Him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone through the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager, eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. Amen. See, you know, that Psalm 19, 1 through 6, just shared, just said what I was just talking about right there. So you might want to write that down. That's a good cross reference to, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's Psalm 19, 1 through 6, backs it up. That's why it's interesting, as I've always shared with you before, you always, you know, you want to have scripture that backs everything up. It says, it says Psalm, 1, Psalm 19, 1 through 6 is very good. Thank you, Vicki. Illustration here. Say, for example, that you walked into an office and found the desk full of work, but, but very orderly. The people were busy on the phones, but obviously pleasant. The floors were clean, the shelves were neat. Even though no one had personally greeted you at this point, you will still have an impression that this was a pleasant office with a neat, hard-working people. You would know something about them simply by looking at what they had done. In other words, you see the impression of how clean everything is. In the same way, God says that all people are without excuse for their ignorance concerning his existence and power. Every day when we see the things he made and gave us, we should know that he is almighty creator. For example, every day, year after year, God has given us the sun, the rain that makes the crops grow for people all over the world. But what did the vast majority of people do? Did they worship God as their almighty creator? No. They deliberately turned away from the knowledge they had concerning God. For example, what did Cain do? He knew what God was, that God was Almighty Creator, and he knew what God had commanded him to do. But Cain, but did Cain obey God? No. Although Cain knew God's will, he refused to obey. Cain deliberately turned his back on the thing which God tried to teach him. Cain's descendants followed him in turning away from God. Day after day, all people saw the things which God had made and the things he provided for them. But most of them refused to thank him and worship him. You see, and um, remember the story of Cain? Right? God told him he wanted an offering, he wanted him to bring. And what did Cain end up bringing? It was basically like fruit, so to speak. And he wanted a he wanted a sacrifice. He wanted an animal. He wanted a sacrifice. But he 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 wanted to give him what he wanted to do. See, he didn't want to obey. He was disobedient. And God said, This is what I want. You know, and Cain and God even had mercy on him because he says to him, If you will just obey, I will accept you. Right there even he's telling him to if you just listen to what I want you to do. But see the sin nature. And you know, 
People live in God's world day after day. Look at all the lost people out there. And they, they, they live in the world here and they deny him. It's, it's so sad. You know, it's so sad. Okay. Well, when Cain brought forth the fruit from the garden, he really wanted God to praise him yeah. for how good he, he did, what a yeah. good job he did. Right, and he took it upon himself to do what he wanted to do. Yeah. You know, it's like if you have a child and you tell your child to uh, uh, clean up his room and make his bed, you know, and your child doesn't do that, does something totally different. Well, I'm going to clean up over in this little closet over here, and I'll just clean it that. And says, Dad, look how good I clean the closet. But Joey, I didn't tell you to clean the closet. I asked you to clean your room up. But no, but I thought that you would like to find it, you know. But that's not what I asked you to do. But see, that's exactly what he did. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he wanted praise for it. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. Isn't that what we want in the sin cursed world? We want to do what we want to do, and then we want to be, say how good a job we did. <laughs> it's the sin nature. That's it. Very good. These are like examples that we see, you know? And, and God said to him, It's like Cain. I could just see. I love you. Just please. Just do what I want you to do, and I'm going to accept you just like I did your brother. Just like us as parents would do to our children. You know, I love you, Susie, Joe. If you will do this just as I love your brother, I'm going to do to you. I love you equally, both the same. See the parallels right there. But, no. So what's he do? He goes and makes it even worse, doesn't he? Huh? He gets what? The big jab, jealousy, and rules. And then he commits the ultimate, murder. You know what I mean? Right there. So see, you see the progression. You know, it's so, so sad. So right there. But very good, thanks for the input there. Okay, I gotta pick up, find out where. Okay, it says, but most of us refuse to worship the Lord. Okay, finally, God sent the flood to show grace to Noah and his family. Somebody read Hebrews 11, 7. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 7. Verse anybody got? By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Amen. Thank you. Says, now you think of Noah. It says, by faith. Noah didn't know what an ark was. He didn't. He just, you know, was God's giving him all these measurements, telling him what, he has no idea what's going on here. What's he doing? He's just stepping out by faith. You know, uh, he didn't know what this big boat was going to be all about. He just uh, followed the Lord with faith. You know, and uh, and trusted him. And um, it says, finally, God sent the flood, but showed grace to Noah and his family because Noah trusted God. Even though he didn't understand, you know, he trusted God. Right there. Okay, and we're going to close next week. This right here will be on uh, Romans 121. Next class there. Pick it up here, Romans 121. We'll close in prayer. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this Bible study tonight, Lord God. Thank you for all those who came out to study your word. I pray, Lord God, you give them traveling mercies on their way home tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 How did the football thing go first? Good. I had uh, 20.